Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our panel on practical insights into commercial arbitration in the Abraham Accord economy. I'm Professor Maya Steinitz from the University of Iowa. We have an outstanding panel of experts who will provide comments and answer some questions about this new exciting and challenging dispute resolution landscape. The program is 90 minutes long, an hour for panel presentations and half an hour for questions and answers from the audience. I'm going to introduce our panel very briefly. I'm going to assume everybody has read the program. And then I'm going to say a few words of background about the Abraham Accords. But first I'd like to introduce the latest addition to the panel who was not on the program. So I'll introduce him with a little bit more detail. And that is His Excellency Justice Shamlan al Sawalehi of the Court of Appeals and uh, the judge in charge of the arbitration division of the Dubai International Financial Center courts. Before joining the judiciary, in addition to a wide ranging commercial and criminal practice, Justice Al Sawalehi served as sole co arbitrator and chair in numerous arbitrations. He has expertise in common law, civil law, and Sharia law. The rest of our panel, in order of appearance, uh, are as follows Professor Van Hoff, the General Director of the London Court of International Arbitration. Mr. Daniel Reisner, Public International Law, Defense and Homeland Security Partner at Herzog, Fox and Neyman, a leading Israeli law firm. Mr. Tom Snyder, the Head of Arbitration at the Dubai Office of Al Tamimi, a uh, leading international law firm. Mr. Arif Ali, the Co-Chair of Deckard's International Arbitration Group. And Gary Bourne, Chair of the International Arbitration Group of Wilmer Hale. Now, a few quick words of background about the Abraham Accords for those who are not familiar. The Abraham Accords are a set of normalization agreements that were entered into in late 2020 by Israel, the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. The RAND Corporation has estimated that the so-called peace dividends, the increased economic activity from uh, the Accords is estimated to reach $1 trillion over the course of a decade. Now, even if that's a little optimistic, which I think it may be, the point remains that the economic impact of these accords uh, stands to be substantial, and in fact, it already is. As an example, news outlets uh, reported in early 2021 about the launch of a $10 billion Emirati fund intended to invest in strategic sectors in Israel. The commercial effects are not going to be limited to the region. According to the US Chamber of Commerce, the um, I'll quote here, start quote, American businesses will also benefit greatly from this agreement. Israel and the UAE are the US two largest trading partners in the Middle East with two way trade agreements between Israel reaching nearly 50 billion and 25 billion with the UAE in 2018, end quote. Commercial disputes will undoubtedly arise from these new economic ties. And these are expected to be overwhelmingly resolved through international arbitration. Uh, we're gathered here today to provide some practical insight, discuss practical implications for practitioners of international arbitration and those who are assisting their clients in designing their transactions in the region. A um, couple of technical comments is I'll be monitoring the questions um, which uh, audience members are invited to put in the um, chat box. That's where I will be monitoring and selecting some questions for the Q&A portion of the panel. Uh, and finally, everybody, please be advised that this panel is being recorded. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to turn the floor to Professor Van Hoff. Thank you very much, Maya, for these introductory comments. And thank you all for um, the opportunity to discuss the Abraham Accords economy and the role of arbitration um, in, in this new environment. I think it's a perfect illustration, a perfect platform for demonstrating how arbitration can enhance opportunities that are not necessarily created by arbitration, but where arbitration can be used as a mean 
to foster economic developments that will uh, hopefully um, um, lead to far-reaching developments in uh, the region, uh, and in this case, um, uh, the connections between the various countries you have identified. Um, arbitration is historically a means of peaceful dispute resolution between participants of very diverse regions. And it is because it is able to connect participants from very different jurisdictions that it is potentially such, such a successful and useful um, uh, tool also, uh, also in this occasion. Um, I'm obviously going to speak to you with my institutional hat on, but before I do so, I would like to stress that I speak also as a person. I speak as a person who is interested and passionate about the region. I studied Arabic in, in, in university um, for a short while and not hugely successful. I've traveled to uh, uh, very different parts of the region. But I particularly want to stress that I speak not only as the Director General of the LCA, but as a professor of civil law and arbitration law, and as an arbitration practitioner. I should also admit that I wrote my PhD on non-institutional rules, the UNCITRAL rules, but still I'm gonna to talk to you all and hopefully discuss with you in the Q&A the benefits specifically of institutional arbitration. So when you choose arbitration, you typically do that because you have more faith in a neutral platform, potentially more neutral, neutral than the courts of either of the two jurisdictions involved. Because in cross-border disputes, even if there's nothing wrong, objectively speaking, with the courts of the um, players from both sides, it may be beneficial to choose a truly neutral form. Now you can obviously choose the courts of a third country, but that is not usually the most obvious choice because then you will need to get lawyers from that jurisdiction. You may need to get interpreters um, in, and, and arbitration is able to, if you will, be a bridge between the two jurisdictions without leaving the, um, the comfort zone of your own jurisdiction altogether. Now, how does that work? The beauty of arbitration is that it is seated in a particular jurisdiction. So by choosing arbitration in London or in uh, Jerusalem or in Dubai, you will forge a connection with the legal system of the seat, but you can still craft an agreement that, for instance, refers to institutional rules, such as the rules of the ICC or the LCIA. You can also mix and match by choosing a substantive law of another country. And what we see um, frequently is that if you have players from two jurisdictions, they may choose the seat in one jurisdiction and they may choose the substantive law of the other jurisdiction. At the LCA, what we see uh, surprisingly often is that parties that have no connection whatsoever with the United Kingdom choose London as a seat and choose English substantive law. And why is that? I think that is in part a reflection of the makeup of the LCIA's caseload. The LCA sees a lot of financial transactions which are often governed by English law, even if there's no other connection with the UK. Why the seat in England? Well, a good seat requires a good legislative framework and it requires a good judiciary. That need not be the same uh, level of involvement that you would get if you were to hear your case in court uh, 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 as you would in civil proceedings, but there will always be a court that has supervisory jurisdiction. And it is important to choose a seat that has a constructive, supportive legislative and judiciary framework, but where there is not unnecessary intervention. And what we see is that people often choose the UK because they uh, are of the view that the level of support is the right level, not too much and not too little. What are 
other considerations, and I'm sure my colleagues will, will address that further, but the New York Convention is an international convention that ensures the uh, enforceability uh, of arbitration awards in other countries. So in crafting an agreement in the kind of contracts and disputes we're talking about here, where you may have practitioners and parties from, let's say, Israel on the one hand and UAE on the other hand, you need to make sure that you choose a seat in a member state of the New York Convention, and there's several options. If you then think about the institution, you do not necessarily need to choose an institution in either Israel, again, as an example, and the UAE. You can, but you don't have to. You have the substantive law to play with. And you should also think about the level of administration you would like. Some arbitration institutions are more hands-on than others. Some review the, 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 the draft award, scrutinize the draft award to a greater extent than others. So these are the kind of considerations you, you, you may wish to um, keep in mind when you start thinking about where would participants coming from the Algiers Accords regions choose. It is possible that they will seat their disputes in, 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 in one of the two countries I've just identified. In practice, choosing a neutral third country can be quite helpful. Um, you might also consider choosing a seat in a third country, but choosing as the venue for your arbitration, a place uh, uh, nearer to the party. So you can have Paris or London as your legal seat, but you may choose to do your hearings in Dubai. So there's quite a few options and uh, not necessarily a one size fits all. But what I would say about the LCIA is that it is a, an institution that is very much used to working with practitioners and parties from both, let's say, sets of, uh, of jurisdictions. That is in part a reflection of the applicable law. As I mentioned, the LCA sees a lot of English law disputes. And of course, uh, certainly in the DIFC and in, uh, uh, and, and in Israel, English law uh, is very important. It is not strictly speaking, the applicable law, certainly not um, uh, in Israel, but English law has been quite important in uh, shaping Israeli law. And of course, in the DIFC, English law is uh, uh, used. So having an institution with affinity with that market and with a pool of arbitrators who are familiar with that law can be helpful. But you're not limited to the arbitrators that are uh, on, let's say, a list of an institution. Typically in arbitration, you can nominate the arbitrators of your choice. That's also the feature of the LCA rules, but an institution will help you find arbitrators if and when one of the parties does not opt to select an arbitrator or if the parties cannot agree on a sole or chair. So the kind of support you get from an institution is of a different kind that you get when you choose ad hoc arbitration and where the courts may then do the absolute minimum to keep the arbitration ongoing. Traditionally, typically I would say it is helpful to choose an institution um, to keep the arbitration going. And if you choose an arbitration institution that does not interfere too much, you do not need to worry too much about um, having um, uh, uh, an institution in addition to the arbitrators. So these are just some general considerations, Maya, that I'd like to put in front of you all. Think about the seat, but keep in mind that seat and venue are not identical. Think about the type of administration an institution performs. Is it very invasive or is it sort of standoffish? Um, and try to think about building bridges, because at the end of the day, I think that is what the Abraham Accords are very much for. And it could be that an institution which is not strictly speaking in the region, but which does know the region, could be a good choice. So with that, Maya, I'm going to leave my opening remarks and look forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Van Hoff. And I turn the floor to Mr. Daniel Reisner. 
Thank you, Maya, and uh, thank you all for joining, and especially thank you, Maya, Maya for organizing and getting us in line uh, in, in this event. Um, what I want to speak briefly about is the Israeli perspective of the dispute resolution uh, uh, consequences of the Abraham Accord. By way of introduction, for those of you who did not read my bio, I spent many years working for the Israeli government, including 20 years as an Israeli government's uh, lawyer and negotiator for the peace process. And so I was fortunate enough to be the lawyer negotiator for the peace process with Jordan. I spent 20 years negotiating with our neighbors, the Palestinians. And I stopped doing this in 2014, which just goes to prove that I must have been an obstacle because six years later, suddenly we have the Abraham Accords and, 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 and life is interesting. Um, having said everything I, I, I did right now, I do want to state that the Abraham Accords are unique from the Israeli perspective. We have made peace with Egypt, we have made peace with Jordan, uh, but the Abraham Accords are the first time that we have made peace with countries with which we are actually maintaining very significant commercial relations. Or in other words, the peace between Israel and Egypt and the Egypt and Jordan, both of which I worked on, are still to this day cold peace. In other words, there's a limited level of commercial and personal interaction between the countries. However, the peace or the normalization, as it is called, between Israel and the UAE and the other countries you mentioned, has become from it went from zero to sixty in in, in four seconds. Um, and all the five-star hotels in the UAE had kosher food within two weeks of the signing of the agreement. So this is running very fast. Now, why is this important? Because we from the Israeli side have very little experience in uh, 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 resolving disputes with our neighbors in commercial uh, uh, fora. Why is that? Because there has been relatively almost no trade between Israel and its neighbors, even the peaceful ones. So what we are now seeing is a unique opportunity for us where we are seeing new markets open up in both directions, but we have no experience in working with one another or negotiating the, the dispute resolution uh, environment. I'd like to share a few pieces of information about the Israeli experience. Um, most of the companies wanting to do business with the Gulf and I will share with this audience that uh, my first trip to the Gulf was in 2007 when I negotiated secret agreements to sell stuff from Israel. So I've been doing this for many, many years. Um, but today, most of the companies venturing forth into this relationship are sophisticated companies supported by sophisticated law firms such as mine, but there are others. Which means that the lawyers supporting these processes understand international dispute resolution as Professor Van Hoff has explained. And one of the first things we teach everyone going into this world is do not agree to the dispute resolution mechanism in the other side's country, because it gives them the home court advantage, and especially if you don't know enough about the dispute resolution mechanisms in the home court country. And that leads, leads us to where we are right now. Uh, Israeli companies are making deals, uh, UAE companies are investing in Israel, uh, funds and others, and yet we do not have, we, the Israeli legal uh, uh, community, we do not have a good understanding or any experience in negotiating and implementing and more importantly, handling disputes with these jurisdictions. So we have here uh, Judge al Sawalahidi. Uh, uh, we do not have an experience with the DIFSC and how it would treat foreigners in general, Israelis in particular, and there are questions which arise when we do business in other uh, 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 countries, interest, it does interest, uh, uh, Sharia law, uh, the problem with interest, compounded interest, we don't know this stuff. And when we don't know, and we don't know how enforcement under the New York Convention will work, etc. So when we don't know, we are hesitant. When we are hesitant, we, we, we prefer to go to neutral venues. And as Professor Van Hoff said, our default reflex is to say, you know what, let's go for English law because we understand it, although we do not practice it. Let's go for a seat 
in a jurisdiction which is neutral and London looks very neutral to us. And that's probably fine an institution. And you know what the LCIA looks like a perfect choice. And, and, and as regards venue, sometimes we'll want to save costs. So we'll choose a venue which is closer to the Middle East than London and we'll have the arbitration in Cyprus or in, or in Vienna or in somewhere else, but under all the other components. And while this can become extraordinarily complicated, at least we prefer to keep it simple. So we would prefer English law, English seat, and uh, etc., just so that we don't force the arbitrators to start managing a very complicated situation where they need expert opinions on, on foreign laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you should expect that from the Israeli side, most of the companies involved in international trade with the UAE will be looking for dispute resolution mechanisms in neutral territories such as the one I just described. That being said, uh, uh, we also understand that the dispute resolution clauses are usually negotiated at the end of an agreement. After all of the substance and the money has been agreed upon, and quite often the clients couldn't be bothered to understand the complexities and implications of, of choosing one seat over the other or one dispute resolution institution over the other, and they leave it to the lawyers. In other cases, the clients will agree in return for something more substantive in their views to a foreign seat or the other party's uh, institution, etc. In such cases, I will just tell you that Israel, at least, uh, is a relatively good location for dispute resolution for non-Israelis. Israeli courts have proven that they can be objective when dealing with a dispute between an Israeli and a non-Israeli entity. Israel enforces an, uh, foreign arbitration proceedings almost always. Uh, 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 the capability of using the public policy exception in Israel are extraordinarily limited, especially if the arbitration took place in a serious country with, with a good reputation. So generally speaking, it would not be a huge mistake to agree to an Israeli seat or, an Isra or, or, or application of Israeli law, if that is the result of the commercial negotiation. However, as I previously said, we do not know enough about the other side to be able to say the same is true uh, when we go uh, to negotiate, et cetera, in the UAE. And in that respect, we have a lot to learn. And one of the things we would like to better understand, of course. Uh, the final thing I wanted to say, uh, uh, Maya, and I'm trying to keep it within our 10 minutes, so hopefully I'm doing a reasonable job, is uh, Maya and I have a shared history. Um, I personally have a fondness for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. In other words, staying away from courts and I apologize to the judge on our panel. Uh, because in many jurisdictions, courts are, are in some respects uh, uh, a risk. And I prefer uh, uh, alternative dispute resolution, negotiation, mediation, conciliation, and arbitration where possible. With that in mind, Maya was involved as well. I was one of the founders of an arbitration uh, 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 center in Jerusalem called the Jerusalem Arbitration Center. I think it was about seven or eight years ago, uh, where we agreed to set up an arbitration center for Israeli and Palestinian commercial disputes. And we especially chose East Jerusalem, a disputed territory as our seat so that both sides would feel at home because both sides claim it's theirs. And we got the ICC in Paris to uh, 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 sponsor the facility and we set it up and we had a great launching ceremony and we had the EU come in in the launching ceremony and we didn't get one case, one case ever. And why didn't get one case? There were a lot of reasons, but one of them is that at the end of the day, when you have complicated relationships, people are less open to the possibility of risking their money in an untried arbitration facility. And as a result of that, that wonderful venture did not succeed, although the facility was established, the arbitrators were ready, the building was there, everything was ready, but no one came. My belief, however, that the relationship between the UAE and Israel is, and, and the other countries involved uh, is going to be different because here there are real opportunities 
There's a real willingness on both sides to create new realities and where opportunities exist, deals happen. And when deals happen, conflicts and disputes will arise, which will mean we will get not a small number of dispute resolution cases relating to the Abraham Accords. I'll stop here, Maya, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. And I turn the floor to Tom Snyder. Great, thank you very much, Maya, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a, a real pleasure to take part in this panel. Thanks to Maya and the University of Iowa for uh, organizing it, the LCIA for sponsoring it. Um, I, I, I approach this with just a bit of trepidation because I'm sort of sandwiched in between Daniel's uh, hesitation and uh, uncertainty uh, in relation to home court advantages uh, and, and Judge Shamlan's experience and expertise, which will follow me. Uh, but my task is to provide an overview of the dispute resolution options available in the UAE. I'll be focusing primarily on the arbitration options. I think Judge Shamlan will pick up on some of the litigation options as well and see if we can persuade Daniel that, that maybe, just maybe, uh, uh, some parties will agree to resolve their uh, disputes here in the UAE. Um, you know, at the outset, I, I, I have to say, Maya mentioned the peace dividend that is to be expected as a result of the accords. And, and Daniel's already mentioned that uh, you can now get kosher food um, in restaurants here in the UAE. Uh, the practical impact of these accords was sort of brought home to me um, by the simple fact of within a few weeks of the accords coming into effect, we could get Israeli pomegranates uh, at the supermarkets uh, here in the UAE. And shortly after that, you could get uh, Israeli wine uh, in the duty-free shop. So uh, it is having an impact um, at sort of the granular level. And I think there's no doubt uh, we'll see a significant impact um, on larger scale trade and investment in the future. I think there's already a couple of uh, fairly significant uh, investments being made in the oil and gas industry and other industries. But how do we go about resolving these disputes uh, in the UAE, assuming the parties might agree uh, to dispute resolution um, here in the UAE. I, I see there are several colleagues um, from Dubai and Abu Dhabi on. A lot of this would be secondhand uh, information to them. They'll, they'll know this quite well. But I think for newcomers to the dispute resolution landscape in the UAE, it can seem a bit complicated. And so let me see if I can uh, try to simplify that just a bit for you. Um, of course, the UAE is a New York Convention country, uh, ratified the New York Convention in 2006. Um, in terms of arbitral jurisdictions, Jackie was talking about arbitral seats uh, in her comments. In terms of arbitral jurisdictions, we actually have three of them uh, here in the UAE. Um, the one I will start with is what we call the onshore uh, jurisdiction, uh, and it's governed by uh, when it comes to arbitration, it's governed by federal law number six of 2018, which is effectively uh, the federal arbitration law uh, in the UAE. Um, this was a really welcome development uh, when it was uh, uh, when it came into force in 2018. Prior to that, um, the sort of the rules governing uh, the laws governing arbitration in the UAE were limited to a few provisions in the Civil Procedure Code. Uh, the federal arbitration law is a comprehensive uh, arbitration law. It is uh, unsatural model law uh, compliant, uh, covers the arbitral process uh, from A to Z. I think one thing that is really interesting to me about the federal arbitration law considering it that it came into effect in 2018, it was one of the first national arbitration laws to explicitly make reference to the fact that modern means of communication and technology could be used in the arbitration process uh, for things uh, from uh, the deliberations of the tribunal to the conduct of the hearings themselves uh, to the hearing of witnesses. And of course, this was all two years before uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, occurred. So one could say uh, that uh, the UAE federal arbitration law anticipated uh, the pan pandemic. Um, I, I think if you, if you wanted to, to quibble with some of the provisions uh, in the federal arbitration law, you certainly could. I think one of the um, provisions that at least I would like to see um, uh, 
changed or modified is the requirement uh, that a signatory must have specific authority to bind a party to arbitration. And this provision can certainly um, cause some challenges, uh, 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 some challenges, some difficulties when it comes to annulment applications and the like, but overall, uh, unsatural model compliant law. So that's, that's arbitral jurisdiction number one. Arbitral jurisdiction number two is the Dubai International Financial Center, uh, the DIFC, which is a free uh, ec economic or financial free zone here in Dubai, which has its own set of commercial laws, uh, its own uh, judiciary on which Justice Shamlan sits, um, and has its own um, arbitration law, uh, DIFC law number one of 2008. Here again, uh, Ansatral uh, compliant um, uh, arbitration law. And uh, we'll hear more about this later, but the DIFC uh, is a common law uh, jurisdiction. The third uh, arbitral jurisdiction in the UAE, the third potential seat of arbitration, is another financial free zone. This one's located down the road in Abu Dhabi. Uh, it's the Abu Dhabi Global Market, or the ADGM. Uh, it, too, has its own unsatral compliant uh, arbitration law. Uh, the uh, ADGM arbitration regulations, uh, despite the fact that they're called the arbitration regulations, they function just like a national arbitration law uh, would. Uh, that was amended recent, that came into force in 2015, was amended recently in 2020. Some interesting uh, amendments were made at that point that I, I don't think have sort of uh, captured the attention and, and, and have entered into the discussion as much as maybe they should. There are provisions on uh, part the conduct of parties and party representatives in the arbitral process, and uh, provisions on summary disposal of claims um, I'll, I'll certainly stand to be corrected, but I think it's the first example uh, of a, a national arbitration law, at least that I'm aware of, that have incorporated sort of these uh, early dismissal or expedited pr procedure, uh, expedited uh, uh, dismissal procedures. Um, from arbitral uh, laws, I want to uh, make a few comments on arbitral institutions um, here in the uh, in the uh, UAE. Um, we we have several uh, homegrown arbitral institutions uh, in the country. I think in terms of recent developments, um, the um, uh, uh, matter that has, has certainly captured uh, the most attention is uh, decree, uh, Dubai Decree Number 34, uh, which was issued in uh, September, uh, which effectively uh, abolished uh, the DIFC LCIA, which was a joint venture between the LCIA and the Dubai International Financial Center, uh, as well as the Emirates Maritime Arbitration Center, and effectively uh, merged their uh, activities into the Dubai. Uh, International Arbitration Center, the DIAC. Um, I, I think one of the uh, 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 positive developments to come out of that is the fact that DIAC does now have a new set of arbitration rules that were issued in March of 2022. Uh, it's the first time those rules have been updated since 2007. Uh, so that uh, was a, a good development um, in that respect. Uh, there are other arbitral institutions um, in the country. Uh, most of the Emirates will have their own homegrown uh, arbitral institution. Abu Dhabi has one, uh, uh, Ras al Khaima, uh, Ajman, Fujera, uh, but none of these really have the caseloads uh, that, that DIAC does and that DIFC LCIA did uh, uh, before it um, uh, ceased operations. Um, just to note briefly on the uh, ADGM, um, the ADGM, as I mentioned earlier, is a financial free zone. Um, it doesn't have its own arbitral institution that administers cases. Uh, there is an ADGM arbitration center, um, but that's uh, more akin to, let's say, the New York International Arbitration Center. For those of you who are familiar with that, it's, it's basically a set of facilities uh, that parties can use for hearings. Uh, with that said, uh, the ADGM Arbitration Center does have a panel of arbitrators, and they have issued uh, the ADGM arbitration guidelines, which um, can be used uh, uh, basically uh, as a set of procedural rules uh, for ad hoc or other um, arbitrations. I should also mention that the ICC in 2018 um, 
opened a rep office in the ADGM and last year converted that to a full-fledged uh, case administration um, office uh, there. Um, I think what I will do is stop at this stage because I'm, I'm coming up on my 10 minutes uh, and I, I believe Judge Shamlan will be covering some of the enforcement related issues, um, but happy to jump back in on that uh, if and when it makes sense. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, and I uh, move it right on to Judge Shaman. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for inviting me to uh, uh, speak in this uh, forum uh, with a dis distinguished guest. Uh, in, in fact, we don't need to uh, convince Daniel because it's already started. The good news I have for you today, uh, they can copy the registry here. There is already a case being uh, registered before the DIFC court involving an Israeli party. And uh, they've chosen the IFC court here. Of course, they haven't chosen the arbitration, but they've chosen the DIFC court in a small claim tribunal where involved a claimant from the UAE and the defendant from the Israeli. And it uh, happened exactly after the, the, the Abraham Accords. And it involved the uh, uh, tourism uh, 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 business. So you can imagine it's already started there. We have that type of uh, uh, thinking to, to, to select a Dubai, one of the Dubai uh, uh, court as, as a forum for dispute. Now, um, the, what I would like to emphasize here um, is that if, if you have a negotiation, as you know, and, and you want to choose the seat, uh, the forum of, of dispute, and if you don't want to go for any of local court, and you're thinking of arbitration institution, uh, still you can go for any of those arbitration institution, um, including LCIA, ICCU, or SIAC, whatever it is. But uh, uh, as, as, as uh, Jackie have said, you have to choose the seat. So what type of seat that will give you the advantage you are thinking of in terms of uh, a more friendly court to the arbitration, the court, they can support your arbitration clause. The court can deal with the interim measures down the, during the procedure before you get your arbitration award or, or, or any uh, uh, partial award. You have to think about this type of court, a supervisory court, uh, they can help you with this type of uh, application. And of course, uh, you can still go for English court or, or the, the arbitration can be seen in, 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 in London for, for sake, but um, there is two advantages the IFC court can bring here in terms of seat uh, as a seat for arbitration. One is the enforceability. So you have an uh, interim measures uh, order uh, before you get there to the end of the arbitration and you can enforce it uh, among the Arab country or the GCC country, because this is, will be seen as an order or judgment came out of a country signatory to the Riyadh Convention for Enforcement. Uh, th th this is one of those advantage. Maybe you, you will be struggle if you get an order or judgment from UK, let's say, or someone else where they don't have, they are not party to the Riyadh Convention, let's say. Uh, the other thing, um, is the Israeli law firm or Israeli uh, lawyer, they can be registered and litigate before the DIC court without having a background in common law or be qualified in common law, as long as they can uh, show that uh, they have a qualification, of course, in civil law, and they speak the English language uh, professionally, and they have done some arbitration cases before that. So we have those two advantage on, on the above of another seat in common law jurisdiction, plus you will get the quality of judgment and order related to enforcement, related to uh, arbitration court uh, cases, uh, have the same quality of, of other, other, other seat. Uh, and, and we have a bunch of judges who are specialized, of course, in arbitration, and they understand the international arbitration very well. So I would say, uh, if you wanna choose the seat of your arbitration, and you wanna do business among uh, those uh, countries who are already uh, party to uh, Abraham Accords, you need to, to take a DIFC court in your consideration, or probably as uh, Tom have said, the Abu Dhabi global market uh, uh, court as well, because we are having the same model and we, we, we're practicing the same, same rules. Um, I, I think this is something um, we need to, 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 to consider. 
Um, now, what has been done uh, so far, as Tom mentioned, uh, the government of Dubai, they decided to merge uh, uh, more than two or three arbitration institutions to one, which is the DIAC, Dubai International Arbitration uh, Center. I sit there as a, one of the court member, and I think there is a lot of develop, development in, the, in that regard. Um, the other things I would suggest as well, and this is what I've done so far, because we're practicing the common law uh, 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 regulation and, 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 and cases, um, we've, we've dealt with a new concept here in this region, which is familiar, very familiar in common law uh, for enforcement, uh, the arbitral award. Um, I've done personally an order for a worldwide freezing order. Now, worldwide freezing order, uh, this is something uh, not this region court familiar with. It's more practice in, in common law. Uh, but we've done, we've dealt with this in the IFC court uh, and anti suit injunction. So we've, we've done an anti-suit injunction uh, before the arbitration started uh, to support the, the, the agreement that, that include arbitration clause. And we prevent party from uh, um, uh, lodging any um, uh, uh, court dispute uh, or any court procedure because there is an arbitration clause. Uh, we, I, I've act as, a, as an emergency arbitrator somehow because we, we used to have um, a lot of uh, LCIA cases, DIFC LCIA cases, and before the cases already uh, uh, registered, um, they approached the DIFC court for uh, interim um, uh, remedy and to freeze assets because the DIFC court judges are very familiar with, with, this, with this practice. But the, uh, what I want to emphasize here to, to get all of those advantage of the uh, seat of the DIFC uh, the new uh, Dubai degree, which Tom was referring to, number 34, it said very clearly, you have to mention in your clause, uh, the seat is a DIFC to get all of those advantage the DIFC court will bring us to your, to your, uh, uh, to, to your case. Uh, I don't wanna say too much, and, and I, would like, I would like to leave the, the, the time for the question and answer later on, but I'm happy to do so, appreciate it. Thank you very much. And our next uh, speaker is Arif Ali. Well, uh, let me add my thanks to uh, Maya, uh, my co-panelists, and all of those who, who are uh, participating uh, in, uh, uh, in this very important event, which I hope will be the first of, uh, of many of its kind. Uh, Maya has asked me to deal with two very significant and large topics. Uh, one is on the practical aspects of the application of Sharia law, uh, and the other is uh, on the characteristics and qualifications of arbitrators. So, uh, Maya, please do use the bell on me if uh, uh, if I run uh, if I run over uh, or I'm getting close to my time. So. Uh, I will say that I am not a uh, Sharia law scholar uh, or a religious scholar, uh, and whatever comments uh, I'm offering are those from the perspective of a common law trained uh, lawyer uh, who has argued and arbitrated many cases under civil law and probably more cases under civil law and English law than my own jurisdiction here in the United States and as someone who has been called upon to arbitrate a number of cases uh, where Sharia law has been uh, uh, an issue of application. And I start off with that point simply because uh, Sharia law is abstract as it might be and is, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, as abstract as it might be is something that does have a practical application in, uh, in modern commercial uh, relations. Um, so, you know, to, to, to just to, to punctuate the importance of how Sharia law has, uh, has, uh, has developed in Islamic jurisprudence, uh, it has developed most importantly uh, within the context of, uh, of arbitrations. I mean, we have, uh, we have historical records that tell us that not long after the founding, and, and by the way, very relevant to the Abraham Accords is that not long after the founding of Islam, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, the peace be upon him, in uh, 622 AD promoted, specifically promoted the use of arbitration 
after he settled in, uh, in Medina, which was a Jewish city, to resolve disputes between uh, Muslims and Jews who are residing uh, in Medina. So we, we, can, we can look back to one of the first examples of arbitration uh, as a method of dispute resolution uh, that has specific historical relevance to the, uh, the Abraham Accords. Uh, and I think that there's a, there's, you know, a nice book ending uh, that, uh, uh, and, and a story that still uh, has yet to be, uh, to be written. Um, so in, insofar as, as uh, Sharia law is, is concerned, uh, there is no ecclesiastical authority as such that uh, issues uh, that, that, that provides the source uh, of law or that, uh, that announces the law. Now, of course, there are in certain uh, countries, there are Sharia councils that have been set up to support the Islamic banking uh, industry in particular. There are uh, important institutions, uh, academic institutions, such as Al-Azhar University uh, in Cairo, where you have religious scholars that who issue uh, fatwas. Um, but you know, ultimately, in its you know, in terms of looking at this sort of doctrinally or looking at it from a standpoint of the sources of law, uh, in Sharia law, there are four. Obviously, the first is uh, the Quran. Uh, the Quran, albeit it is an extensive document, doesn't contain uh, a code of law uh, as such. And of course, in everything that I say, uh, uh, Justice Al-Salah, please do correct me. Uh, you are by far more accomplished in this area than, than I am, uh, Ustad. Uh, so first is the, is, is the, is the Quran. Uh, the second is the Sunnah, which is the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad that are that were recorded in after his uh, after his uh, his passing, and these are uh, reflected in so-called hadith, and there are the authentic hadith, uh, and those that have, let's say those have been verified through a a very well-established methodology. Uh, and then there are those that people can follow if they so choose, but they are not the authentic, uh, the authentic hadith that can inform uh, the, let's say, Quranic principles. Uh, the third source of law is ijtihad, which I think uh, can best be translated uh, and in, as, as interpretation. And it is effectively the consensus of the community on particular principles as to how they will be interpreted and applied if the Quran and the Sunnah uh, are, are silent. And the final source is what is known as Qiyas, uh, which is a method of logical inference from the primary sources and legal reasoning by analogy. Now, why do I, why do I mention these particular sources of law? Because today, uh, one doesn't turn to specific Sharia principles as such, but looks at statutory codification, statutes that reflect Sharia principles and not always faithfully so. So there is a wide divergence in the way in which uh, Sharia law is reflected in the laws of different uh, jurisdictions where Sharia law is a source of law. And then there are other jurisdictions such as Saudi Arabia where Sharia law is the source uh, of law. And then there's you know, a wide divergence uh, in between. But I think the important aspect from a practical standpoint is to understand that it, today we have, uh, we have legislation, we have statutes that reflect Sharia pr principles. We have precedent that is also uh, followed uh, that where, where Sharia principles are, are applied by, by the courts. And then we'll be, uh, uh, and then that can be followed. There are the opinions of, uh, of, of scholars. Uh, and so there is, there is, there's a wide body of, of law. And as, as one looks at all of the Sharia uh, jurisprudence or, or law, what we see is a huge divergence in terms of 
let's say, faithfulness to Quranic principle versus the other end of the spectrum where there is uh, application of the law through reasoning. And in each of the schools of Islamic uh, law and thought, there is a divergence in terms of how uh, the law is interpreted and applied. And from the standpoint of the practitioner, it's important to understand these sources of law that I've just mentioned, and it's important to understand the methodology. Just as we have a methodology in common law in terms of how we apply, let's say in the United States, stare decisis as precedent, or we, uh, we look at persuasive authority, or we look at the methodological approaches uh, in, in civil law, there is a methodological approach uh, in the in the context of, uh, of 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 Islamic law and and how it applies, and you see this in the different schools of uh, Islamic philosophy and legal thought. And there are a number of schools, which are the Hanafi school, the Maliki school, the Shafi school, the Hanbali school, the Jafari school, and these are all, let's say, in the most simplest form schools of thought that, and as I said earlier, that reflect uh, the, the uh, faithfulness to the revelation uh, and the hadith to uh, legal reasoning uh, and an application. So methodologically, practitioners need to understand that there is a specific methodological approach that needs to be, uh, that needs to be adopted. Now, why is this important? Because so I said earlier, you do see that Sharia is a source of law, it is the source of law, but you find that the Sharia is also reflected in, uh, in, in certain conventions, like the Riyadh Convention that provides for the recognition and enforcement of judicial uh, judgments, and the, and the Riyadh Convention specifically provides that uh, awards or judgments may not be recognized if, uh, if they're contrary to the Sharia or good morals uh, and and public uh, and public policy. So let me you know try and get uh, a little bit uh, more 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 practical, um, if uh, if I may, uh, and just you know point out a few a few areas of uh, the practical application of of uh, Islamic law principles in the context of uh, of of international. Uh, arbitration before I turn to the topic of, uh, of arbitrators. Insofar as this first start off with uh, arbitrator qualifications, uh, there is nothing in uh, specifically in, uh, in, 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 in Sharia uh, that, that dictates uh, the, uh, the qualifications of arbitrators uh, as such, other than those individuals must be honest, they must be respected, uh, and they reflect the types of principles that, for example, you might find in the exit convention with respect to uh, to arbitrators. Now, one question that uh, that comes up often and that I'm asked is, well, what about the the status of women as arbitrators in uh, countries that uh, that uh, observe the, in some respect of the other uh, Sharia. Now, of course, in the UAE and Bahrain, there is no restriction at all. There used to be restrictions in Saudi Arabia, but as of the new Saudi Arabian arbitration law in 2012, uh, there are no gender requirements. There is no stipulation as to the gender of, uh, of an arbitrator. The Saudi arbitration law simply states that an arbitrator must be legally competent, be of good conduct and behavior, and hold a degree in Islamic or legal studies. Now, the question might arise as to whether women may be able to pursue such degrees, uh, and indeed uh, they can. And with the further liberalization that's taking place in Saudi Arabia, uh, it will it will be even more commonplace. And in fact, we've already seen as uh, far back now as 2016 the appointment of a uh, a female uh, of a female arbitrator. Uh, it wasn't necessarily an approved appointment, but one that where there was no objection. But it is an important precedent, and I think that I'll come back to this topic uh, very shortly. There is a there's a lot in uh, in Sharia and the different schools of thought regarding when arbitrators can be removed or what the authority is of arbitrators. But today, what applies more than anything else is the authority that exists 
in the laws of, that govern arbitration in particular jurisdictions and in the arbitration rules that, uh, uh, that the parties uh, agree to. Another area where we might see something where we, we, we see the issue of uh, the practical application of Sharia would be in the context of limitations periods. Uh, in, in, uh, in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, a Muslim's right cannot be extinguished or abolished, even if it is remote uh, or in the past. But today we see in the statutes of a number of countries throughout the region that limitations periods are recognized. You will find in contractual principles that Islamic law uh, provides for the strict application of what is contractually agreed. So it is closer in that respect to, let's say, an English law application of contractual principles or contractual interpretation than perhaps one might argue in, in, in the civil law, albeit the principle of good faith is extremely important uh, and is applied within the context of, uh, of, of Islamic law. Going to something like evidence, uh, within the context of, of evidence, evidentiary rules in Islamic law or in the Sharia principles typically relied more on oral testimony, reflecting the oral traditions that uh, pervade, prevailed in the region uh, over documentary evidence, largely because of the forgery, possible possibility of forgery of documents. Today, uh, and really starting from uh, the, 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 I'd say historically, the Ottoman Magella, you tend to find that there's a greater emphasis on, uh, on, on documentary evidence. There's a lot of controversy, that ha there has been a lot of controversy regarding uh, subjects such as interest and how interest can be reflected within the context of, uh, can be awarded uh, in the context of international arbitration. Uh, but uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't have time to, to get into the subject matter of interest, uh, but given the development in the Islamic banking field, there's, uh, there's a lot of guidance that's available to arbitrators as to how they can reflect interest uh, and lost profits within the context of, uh, of, of issuing awards. Um, the second topic that I have, which relates to the, to the, uh, to the qualities of arbitrators, Maya, something perhaps uh, I can come back to because I, I do think it's important uh, to, to address. So with that, uh, thank you all. And, and uh, uh, I stand to be corrected by anyone who is, who is listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arif, who has been given uh, a uniquely impossible task with two very large topics. So uh, I do hope that we'll get back to, um, to the issue of qualifications if we can in the Q&A. Um, and with that, I want to go to our last, but absolutely not least, panelist, Mr. Gary Bourne. Thank, thank you so much, um, Maya, both, both for, for that kind reference, but also as, as Daniel and others have said for, for putting this together. Thank, thanks also to the University of Iowa Law School for, for hosting it and, and perhaps most importantly to, to the other co-panelists and, and the participants who, who took their time to listen today. I think I too have, have been given an impossible task, namely to, to follow on from, from a number of um, excellent presentations. I, I learned more than I'm sure that I'm, that I'm going to at least try to, to teach. Um, let, let me begin by um, saying some things that perhaps are a little counterintuitive. Um, the first is we're here as, as experts, or at least those with familiarity in the field, look to, I think, to, to provide general principles, guidance that, that can be relied on in, in all cases. And, and I'd like to start first with a, a sort of cautionary observation that much of the guidance that, that we give um, can be subject to, to counter examples, things that go against the grain of what we or, or others might prescribe as, as good practice. I, I think, for example, five years ago or so of a case between an Egyptian and Israeli party um, Cairo Regional Center rules 
seated in Cairo. Um, exactly the opposite prescription, in a sense, to, to what we've quite rightly heard, and to be honest, what I will say in a few moments, um, how one oughtn't to, to litigate or arbitrate on one's counterparty's home turf, um, either with the, the choice of an institution or, or the arbitral seat. Um, un unsurprisingly, given that introduction, in fact, what happened was the Israeli party prevailed in, in substantial part in an arbitration that was run in an extremely professional manner by the, the Cairo Regional Center, and, and the award was, was honored, given, given effect, com complied with. Um, and thus, I think one, one cautionary kind of intuitive lesson is that Although there are important general principles that that um, one one ought to keep in mind and and can follow, there are also exceptions. Um, the Abraham Accords bring new commercial relationships, new bridges that produce relationships that are are unforeseen, and importantly, the the solutions for those may also be unique and may cut against the grain of of the general principles that that we all have both learned and, and will um, formulate um, today. The second counterintuitive observation that I'll make as a, a long time student of both international litigation in, in national courts on, on the one hand and international arbitration is that by far the better means of resolving disputes and Shaman, I'm sorry about this, is not national courts. And Jackie, I'm sorry about this too, is not international arbitration. It is instead um, negotiation, sometimes assisted by conciliation or, or mediation leading to a, a negotiated consensual solution um, that can both build new bridges, but also repair old bridges in a way that um, and now apologies to Tom and Daniel, because I know you make your living from representing people in contested proceedings, um, is, is, is much more economic and efficient for, for the parties. So if there is any way to avoid all of the, the advice that, that we're offering by settling things yourselves, particularly I think in, in the context we're talking about, that ought to, that ought to be um, pursued with, with all your energy. Um, and the final set of counterintuitive observations that, that I'd like to make are, you, you can often think of a, a new area that has unique characteristics like disputes between companies from the states that are parties to the Abraham Accords as, as ripe for or inviting a new kind of dispute resolution mechanism, perhaps a new arbitral institution. You can think of them as, as cut out for an institution tailored specifically to, to those parties, those countries, and to the kinds of, of disputes or the legal issues that, that one can anticipate will arise in, in that context. And that would seem logical. Um, there are specialized commodities, insurance, construction, maritime, arbitral institutions that quite successfully cater to specialized types of transactions, parties um, in, in each one of, of those sectors. Uh, unfortunately, I think, although that is an appealing and attractive prospect, experience shows that it's not likely um, to work. Daniel, Mai and I all worked on the Jerusalem Arbitration Center, a, a, an initiative that was, was strongly supported um, in both Palestine, who, who I, I worked with, um, and, and Israel, and, and also had, had very important assistance from, from the ICC. Sadly, as, as Daniel has, has reported, it never got a single case. I mean, it almost got a case, but it turned out it wasn't really a case. Um, and, and, and therefore, um, the center um, was, was, in a sense, stillborn. And I, I think that 
is, is because convincing businessmen to, to use something new, to adopt a, a procedure, especially where the decision maker can impose a result, a decision on the parties, um, raises special concerns on, on the part of, of businesses when that, that procedure is new. I think what, at least from my experience, what, what businesses want is something that is tried and true, something that, that there is a long track record with. And, and as a consequence, although it would be more interesting to design a new type of dispute resolution mechanism tailored specifically to the needs of parties um, taking advantage of the, the Abraham Accords, whether they're pomegranate sellers or tourist companies or or the like, the the more simple advice is is use what already exists. And in that respect, I think there are several excellent choices which already exist and which have already proven themselves able to resolve disputes. Um, arising from from the region broadly broadly described, and, and the ones that I would like to focus on briefly, uh, and, and they'll be familiar to to many in the audience. But perhaps some of my observations will be counterintuitive again. Um, are are the ICC, the LCIA, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, and the ICDR in in the U.S. None of those are are based in in the region, and for that reason are likely um, to, to be viewed as neutral by those in the region. Going away from home, um, often when you go away from, from both parties' homes is perhaps nobody's first choice, but ends up being everybody's second choice and, and therefore acceptable. I don't in any way want to suggest that, that what Tom and, and Arif have said about institutions in the region, um, whether, whether DIAC or a reconstituted Abu Dhabi Chamber of Commerce arbitral institution or the Cairo Regional Center, which I've already mentioned, um, aren't, aren't excellent choices, um, but business, business people um, often find it easiest to agree to something which, assuming the worst case scenario, that there's a terrible decision in, in the future, they're not going to, to be fired for, for having agreed to. And with that, just very briefly, because, because I do know many of you are, are familiar with this, I think the ICC has, has in, in many ways, the, the best established, most international, widest international caseload of, of all arbitral institutions has to be the starting point and in a fair number of cases, um, the ending point for parties who want to find a way in a non-contentious manner to include an arbitration provision in, in their commercial and for that matter, their other, their other contracts. The SEC has been criticized perhaps subtly by some as being too slow, too intrusive, too over, over managed in a sense. On the other hand, it's taken um, assiduous steps in, in recent years to, to try and address those concerns. And I think from a, a cost perspective, offers good value for the, for the first class um, service that it provides. Uh, the LCIA, Jackie was, was too modest to say, um, is, is an extraordinary choice as well. Um, if one, uh, and particularly if one accepts the notion that, that English law provides a suitable framework for, for the party's um, substantive obligations. Um, not all parties may accept that, but, but if one does accept that, the LCIA, um, and I can say this from personal experience, does a, a, a spectacular job in administering arbitrations. Nobody will get fired for, for selecting the, the LCIA in a, a dispute arising from the bridges that we're talking about being built under the Abraham Accords. I have a particular fondness, and I should probably recuse myself from discussing the Singapore International Arbitration Center. I know Tom is a member of the Court of Arbitration, 
um, I am no longer, so perhaps I don't really need to recuse myself. It also offers um, quite, quite professional um, administration of arbitrations. It holds itself out as, as being cheaper and quicker than the alternatives, although I'm sure there, there are some who would, would quibble or, or argue with that particular conclusion. The SCDR, the international wing of the American Arbitration Association in the United States is sometimes damned, not by faint praise, but by its title. Um, parties want to avoid um, something with that sort of national association. It nonetheless um, has very modern set of, of institutional arbitration rules, much like the ICC, the LCIA, and SIAC. Um, and it does a good job um, in administering Kevin, Kevin Nash, the, the registrar, that's, is, is one of the more experienced um, administrators in, in the institutional business. I do believe fairly strongly that institutional arbitration is the right choice as opposed to ad hoc arbitration in both these contexts, Abraham Accord context, but also other contexts. I think especially when you have parties that are not accustomed to dealing with one another, not accustomed to having disputes with one another, the, the regularity, the transparency, the predictability that both institutional rules and institutional administration bring, especially at the outset of the, a dispute and arbitration are, are, are critically important. Um, there's been an excellent discussion thus far um, with regard to, to arbitral seats. Um, and I don't and won't need to, to, to go over that again. Often, often parties want a, a neutral professional seat and one, one can um, look to the, to the places where the various institutions I've described are, are located, Paris, London, Singapore, New York, but one needn't look only to those. One can seat the arbitration in any jurisdiction that one, one wishes. And finally, let me just return to, to where I began. Um, the most critical aspect of, of dispute resolution is, is to, to have regard to the particular circumstances of, of the, the party's transaction and, and their dispute. If, if um, contrary to, to some of the suggestions I've made thus far, the parties have a, a commodities transaction, then perhaps a specialized commodities institution makes, makes more sense. If it's a maritime transaction, similar observations may, may apply. At the end of the day, looking like any lawyer does at the specificities of, of the party's relationship is, is probably the most important advice that one, one can, can get. And with that, thank you again, Maya. I hope that was useful. Thank you very much, Gary. Of course, it was useful. Um, I'd like to encourage the audience to submit questions through the chat. We already have one addressed to me and, and I'll answer it. But before I do, um, Jack, you had your hand up before. I don't know if you want to know. Okay. No, I was mixing up the chat and the hands up uh, button. Okay, uh, so while uh, I hope that the audience uh, starts uh, chiming in with some questions, one question that came in, uh, was to me on how, uh, whether and how third party funding uh, might affect international arbitration in the region. And that was probably addressed to me because other than international arbitration, that's one of my main areas of expertise. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not there, um, in uh, the last 15 years or so, 20 almost, one of the main developments in international arbitration has been the rise of third party funding. Um, and it in fact emerged first in Australia and in parallel in international arbitration. And there's a variety of reasons why international arbitration is particularly um, attractive for third party funders and, and needed by parties um, in these forums to access the forum. So um, I do think there's going to be uh, trade in international arbitral claims in the region. I know with respect to Israel that there's a uh, already quite a bit of an industry of third party funders that are based in Israel um, and that the industry is growing globally. I'll only say one more thing here, which is um, that um, there could be very interesting questions. Practitioners want to think about whether someone is funding that is not visible to the tribunal um, and what might be the motivations for funding 
um, arbitrations in this particular context. It's always true that um, defense lawyers should sort of keep an eye out on who's actually funding this and why. Uh, but in this context, I can see um, motivations other than commercial ones that lawyers just want to sort of have their antenna up um, for um, potentially seeking some discovery on that if appropriate. Um, so with uh, that... Um, Ma Maya, do you mind if I just jump in here for, for a moment? Sure, go ahead. Uh, on this, and, and I think that's just to make a couple of points on third-party funding in the region. I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's lagging a bit behind uh, this region compared to other re regions, but I think it is starting to catch on. We are seeing more and more interest, both from funders and uh, clients, uh, in relation to uh, the possibilities that third-party funding uh, presents. We're also seeing it work its way into the, let's say, arbitration and litigation uh, infrastructure in the region. Um, the new DAC rules that I mentioned earlier uh, contain provisions uh, relating to third-party funding. Uh, the 2020 amendments to the ADGM arbitration regulations uh, do as well. Uh, and I believe there's a practice directive in the DIFC courts uh, uh, relating to third-party funding as well. So it is a topic that I think is starting to uh, gain much, much more traction uh, here in the region. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, the next I question. I have a question yeah. in, the, in the, you saw that in the chat. Yes, I'm, I'm going to read that. Um, could you please explain how enforcement under the Riyadh Convention different, differs from enforcement of the, under the New York Convention, and in particular, whether the Riyadh Convention forms part of DFIC uh, as opposed to UAE law. So I don't know if Judge Shamlan wants to address this or maybe um, Tom can yeah. address this. Yes, Judge, yes. go ahead. Uh, of course, Tom can correct me and, or, or add uh, uh, as well. Riyadh Convention dealing with 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 uh, with a court judgment, not dealing with the award. With the New York Convention dealing with enforceability of the international award, this is a, a, bit, a basic difference. But but the point is, if you if you uh, if you have a judgment from a country who has signatory to the Riyadh Convention, then you can uh, directly take it to the enforcement uh, uh, division within the other country, uh, the other court, and 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 enforce it directly without need any further. Uh, clarification or any kind of uh, evidence about your your judgment. This is the so I think I, I hope I answer your question very clearly. Unless there's anything another part I haven't I haven't heard it very quickly very qu quietly. Maybe I could just jump in there quickly to supplement uh, the, the judge's uh, uh, comments. I think that and Tom maybe this is a point you were going to to make. So I apologize if I'm I'm gazumping you, but uh, um, I mean, wasn't there a decision, the DIFC courts uh, sometime last year, the year before, maybe last year, that said something to the effect that the Riyadh Convention uh, doesn't apply in the DIFC courts. Maybe Justice uh, Salehi, yeah. you, you could clarify that. Yeah, that, that was my decision, actually. And we're, uh, <laughs> okay. I, I, dealt, I dealt with that in terms of I don't need to serve there is no need to serve the defendant through the uh, Riyadh Convention. We have to do it through a diplomatic channel. So I accept service by email and by, by courier. Uh, I don't need to, because we saw the international treaty is not binding in the DIFC automatically. It has to be uh, 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 recognized as a law of the DIFC in order to, uh, to, be, to be recognized. And, and that was the practice, of course, for the common law to, to recognize that uh, alternative service. Uh, through the email or through the courier, rather than to go through a specific what has been set out in that Riyadh Convention. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another third party funding question in the comments. I'll read it in a minute, but uh, I wanted to ask actually, Judge, a clarificatory question. You uh, mentioned that Israeli lawyers would be able to uh, represent before your court uh, which I think is fascinating and important to, to know. Uh, but you said they had to be qualified in civil law. Um, is that the case? Or if they're qualified in common law? That... Well, well the, yeah, the, sorry, the, this is the point. I mean, any lawyer can be registered before the DIFC court as uh, they already registered back home with their regulatory, whether 
But, but, but the point is you don't need to show qualification in common law, where you, if you want to practice before the English court, you have to show that, of course, you have a bar, bar exam, you, you have a bar qualification, and so ever. So in the IFC court, um, there is two types of registration. Either you are uh, registered as, as a, a law firm or as individual. And now the Israeli party or Israeli law firms can register before the DIFC court as a law firm. And of course, they can appoint a well-qualified uh, barrister or whatever to argue the case. Or they can register as, as, a, as a, starter, a starting um, ad, uh, advocate before the DIFC court. Uh, and then they can build that experience uh, uh, by time. But there is no need to show a qualification in common law because my understanding, most, most of the Israeli lawyers, they have a civil law background, if I'm not wrong. And, uh, uh, and, and this is the case for any lawyers, not specific for Israeli, but now after, this is the, the, the most important point, after having an Abraham Accord, this is the benefit of there is no restriction of uh, registering such, such a law firm or individual coming from Israel. Thank you for the qualification. Um, another question here from the audience in relation to third party funding, are the sources of funds uh, disclosed? If so, what is the position uh, if international sanctions against the underwriters source have been issued during the course of funding, what happens in this case? Oh. I'm not sure I understand the scenario in the second half of the question, but um, about uh, regarding disclosure, um, a lot of the international institutions have in recent years developed rules or guidelines with respect to third party funding, though not all of them have. Those who have uh, to generalize have gravitated towards at least some form of disclosure, if nothing else, in order to um, ensure that there's no conflict of interest between the funding source and the uh, members of the tribunal. Um, but there's actually a lot of um, nuance and variation in the rules regarding disclosure, whether, when, and how much needs to be disclosed. So it's just an issue to uh, to look into. Um, so I hope I've answered um, uh, at least. Maya, yep. on the second part of the question, if I understand it correctly, um, Nate is asking if the sources of income of the underwriter are, for example, under Russian sanctions and the, because of the Ukraine war, mm -hmm. Would that be an issue in the in, in, in the UAE? So I leave it to uh, my UAE colleagues to because as far as I know, the UAE does not uh, apply any Russian sanctions like the US or the EU or the UK. Um, neither does Israel. That's why it sounds familiar. Uh, 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 but the question is: Will the fact that the source of the money is sanctioned impact? Uh, and underwriting exercise in the UAE? That's a difficult question, I would assume. Happy to hear comments from my colleagues. And the only comments I would say, and I will leave it to Tom to elaborate, uh, there is no such practice in before the UAE court for the uh, third, uh, third party funding to start with. We have in the IFC court the legislation, but we haven't had, much, as, as far as I know, I, I haven't seen one single case regarding to the third party funding. Um, yeah, so I, I think we don't have that much of uh, experience in that regard. Tom, maybe you can add something? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think sort of uh, the, the extent to which this issue has developed here really is this disclosure point um, to ensure that uh, the identity of the funder doesn't create a conflict of interest vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the arbitral tribunal. You know, in, in terms of, um, um, you know, whether the money comes from sanctioned countries or not, I, I, I you know, if that could be proven, I, I would assume a party could raise uh, public policy uh, uh, challenges, but um, I, 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 I wouldn't, um, I, I think it would be uh, quite uh, unlikely for that level of detail to come out uh, at this stage. Yeah, I, uh, this may be, me being in the weeds in my own topic, but it sounds like we should have a separate panel just on third-party funding of arbitrations in, uh, in the Middle East. We have a couple of uh, excellent questions I hope we can get to in our remaining six minutes. Uh, the first is, could, could any of the panelists offer practical tips for avoiding difficulties in enforcement for issues like interest? 
uh, where there may be significant differences in legal or policy environment of the different parties. So if anybody wants to address really quickly, uh, provide one or two top tips to ensure that um, arbitral awards are enforceable um, in your jurisdiction. Speaking about the DIC court or even Dubai court, I, I don't I don't see any problem with, with having interest in the award. I mean, okay. um, they, they're practicing that. Unless Tommy want to add something. No, I mean, we, we re routinely see interest or compensation for delay um, awarded uh, in arbitrations. I mean, there, there could be an issue um, if it's compound interest, um, but that uh, I don't think would result in the set aside or uh, lack of enforcement of the award as a whole. It would only go to that particular component. Thank you. I just add, I'll just add there that I think that there, there are pretty two, I mean, there are various dimensions to, to the issue. I mean, I think one, you have to look at the, what is, what is permissible at the seat of, of arbitration in terms of the award uh, of interest, at least in the form in which it's awarded. Uh, the second is in the enforcement uh, jurisdictions. Um, and this is, you know, this is all going to be governed by by statutory law in in the different jurisdictions, and it may, to a certain extent, also uh, you may have to look at the laws of that apply to the parties to to the dispute. But I think the, I mean, if you you, know, you can look at a jurisdiction like Egypt, where uh, the highest courts have accepted that interest may be awarded, and you may you know, take a look at uh, uh, jurisdictions such as Pakistan, from which I originally hail and uh, uh, Pakistani courts have uh, uh, you know have have flip-flopped on the question of uh, simple versus compound interest as, as Tom was alluding to so I think it is very jurisdictionally specific I think practically you have to get local law advice uh, on that and in certain instances uh, uh, may have to consult with uh, with individuals who are involved in structuring uh, Sharia compliant transactions so that that can be taken into an account in the uh, in the way in which the award is is uh, drafted. I mean, the only principle that I can say that would be where the, the where controversy will arise is if the interest is considered to be usurious and of you know it's a you know saying twenty five percent compounded daily. I mean that's going to probably be unconscionable in uh, yeah. uh, in any in any jurisdiction. Maya, if I might make um, an observation, because the question was focusing on interest, but not limited to interest. And I think it is an example of how important it is to have good arbitrators for which an institution can very much help. Because one of the things you need to do as a tribunal is anticipate uh, where an award may need to be enforced and make sure as much as you can that an award is enforceable. And if, for instance, the seat prescribes certain formalities, which can be as mundane as having the place of residence of the arbitrators somewhere on uh, the first page of the award, it is really important to be familiar with that type of uh, requirements, which is one of the things that as an institution you typically look at directly, but also by ensuring that the arbitrators that deal with a particular case look at some of these issues, which may be seen to me be mundane, but can actually be fatal if you don't get them right. Absolutely. Thank you for jumping in on that. And we have is what will probably be our last question, a question that may be quite easy to answer. Um, in the absence of choice of law uh, clause in the arbitration agreement, what will be the applicable law in the UAE seated arbitration? Uh, will it be Sharia law and other incidental sources? Oh, please. Yeah, no, I think the answer to that is that the tribunal will decide, uh, would have the discretion to decide what the applicable law uh, would be. It, 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 and they would uh, undoubtedly uh, apply a, a commercial law, probably the law of the UAE, but it would just depend on the circumstances of the dispute. I, I, I think that it, it's interesting. Um, th this relates to a, a, another point uh, and, and I'll try to keep this as simple as possible, but 
when you're talking about the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards in the UAE, uh, the exception the exceptions to enforcement are those set out in the New York Convention. When you're um, talking about challenging uh, an arbitral award, um, uh, seeking to set aside an arbitral award uh, rendered in onshore UAE, um, the exceptions uh, are, are, for the most part, the same as those set out in the New York Convention. But there is there are t- a couple of, of additional exceptions. Uh, And one of those is where the arbitral award uh, excludes the application of the party's choice of law for the dispute. And so I think it's just important to uh, emphasize that arbitral tribunals seated in the UAE need to bear that provision in mind. It wouldn't have any application here to this question, because the question is where the parties have not uh, agreed uh, on an applicable law, but in circumstances where, where there might be some amb- ambiguity, uh, the arbitral tribunal will need to be careful about that. Thank you very much. We are out of time. This has been a fascinating discussion. I thank all of the panelists uh, for taking on the challenge of discussing uh, a brand new topic. It's actually a risk to agree to be in a panel on a topic where there is no uh, precedent and the issues are first impression. So I thank all of you. And I want to thank my colleague, Professor Jason Rantanen, who's behind the box that just says College of Law. He's been indispensable behind the scenes. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, and le- uh, hopefully we'll get to do this again once some cases come out and we can actually analyze them. Thank you and good day, good night, good morning, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.